Welcome ladies and gentlemen, my name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Welcome to edition 49 of Food Safety Fridays. Well, I'm pleased to say this week we have got a presenter, a live presenter. The presenter's turned up and he's an excellent presenter as well, Robert Rogers from Metal Toledo. Um, today, Robert's going to be uh, talking about X-ray. Shall we have an X-ray system? Shall we have a metal detector? section system shall we have both shall we have neither well you've got to decide and it's an expensive can be an expensive decision and an important decision to make so robert's going to educate us to make uh, hopefully the right choice uh, make better decision so we'll be over to robert shortly just like to say thank you to the sponsors who help to bring these webinars to you free of charge each week metal toledo safe food 360 fssc 22000 and trace analytics so they give you some bite-sized education uh, and a certificate of attendance every week so that's good stuff uh hello robert how are you doing i'm well how are you i'm fantastic and you're coming to us from i'm uh, in tampa florida from my home base now i wish i was in tampa florida i'm in dreary gray manchester uk but <laughs> never mind Okay, uh, if you can get your presentation ready, Robert, I'll uh, be back to you shortly. Sure thing. Okay. Sure thing. Uh, okay, ladies and gentlemen, next week we do not have a Food Safety Fridays webinar. Um, the next Food Safety Fridays webinar is actually June 17, and it's with Dr. Britta Ball, but it will be worth the wait. Um, the title of Britta's presentation is Five Areas That Influence food safety commitment so she's going to be giving us some tips uh, not just on how to get senior management uh, committed also the food the work units and the employees so top down bottom up she's going to give us some tips to approaching and getting buy into food safety commitment uh, to get food safety behavior improvements and influence that food safety behavior so that's june the 17th with britta um, We'll be sending an email out about that. Next Friday, um, we've got a four hour internal auditor training course. That is a paid for course. It's four hours. It's quite an in-depth course. So if you want to find out more about that, just click the uh, button in the sidebar. Okay. Uh, we've got some polls today, uh, some interactions. So please uh, do take part in that. Also, feel free to type in the sidebar, chat with each other, ask questions, and obviously at the end we'll have some Q&A if Robert's got time for that. So for now, over to Robert. Okay, Robert. Great, you can hear me all right, Simon? Perfect, yeah. Fantastic. Welcome everybody, thanks for joining us today. I'm seeing from the chat room, we've got a very diverse group from all over the world here. Welcome and thank you again for attending. Uh, I'm the Senior Advisor for Food Safety and Regulation with Mettler Toledo. I did want to start off the presentation with just a very, very a brief introduction about my company, Mettler Toledo, as well as uh, an introduction as to why these sort of technologies are, are becoming uh, more and more of a consideration in, in food and manufacturing facilities. Uh, Mettler Toledo, we are a, a very diverse group. We have solutions across the entire value chain, uh, laboratory solutions and process analytics such as uh, pipettes, uh, precision balance machines, uh, our industrial weighing division, uh, both um, truck scales, floor scales, large tank and silo scales, uh, very uh, weighing focused. Uh, our product inspection division, which is what I am a part of, uh, where we do our metal detection, x-ray, check weighing systems, as well as vision systems and serialization systems. We have a logistics divisions with uh, organizations such as uh, UPS and FedEx. Um, and all the way through to retail solutions uh, at the checkout counter and the deli scales. Uh, so as you can see, we have, we have solutions across the entire value chain when it comes to our industry. Our goals are to help to streamline processes, enhance productivity, uh, meet compliance with regulatory requirements, and of course, uh, always focused on improving efficiencies, reducing waste, and optimizing costs. Of course, uh, with that increased focus today on food safety, there's not only the 
uh, globally recognized programs like the BRC, SQF, and uh, FSSC 22000 is one of the sponsors here, as I understand. Uh, there are new food safety laws is in the Americas. Uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act, of course, does have impact from a global perspective on facilities that are importing products or exporting products into the U.S. Uh, those products uh, need to be ensured that they are manufactured to those requirements under the Food Safety Modernization Act. So there's there's certainly been an increased focus on food safety, and, and food safety is a very large uh, discussion topic. One of the areas that we deal with is foreign material control. So one of the poll questions I would have here is, you know, how many of the people in attendance here currently have metal detection or x-ray systems, or maybe even both, or neither. Okay, Robert, I've uh, loaded the poll in the sidebar, uh, and you probably see that uh, the attendees are already uh, diving into that and voting. Um, what have we got? Uh, we've got metal detection coming out just over 60%, x-ray very low at 2%, both at uh, 17, 19 percent, and neither, or neither, neither, 20, 20 percent. Yeah, so I mean, it looks like certainly metal detection is is the the, the primary uh, device used for foreign material control in in, in this poll, um, which is uh, is understandable. Uh, historically, it's been around for a much longer time in utilization in the field than than say an X-ray system is. Uh, but we are starting to see more and more facilities actually adapting both technologies. <coughs> oh goodness, excuse me. Uh, there, the, the 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 odd thing is, is there isn't a silver bullet out there. There isn't the end all, catch all, detect all type machine out there. So it is really a combination of not only electronic solutions like metal detectors and x-ray systems, but other solutions throughout the process like screens and magnets, sieves, uh, and visual inspection even still to this day. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, to see those results there. Okay. Yep. Okay, move on, Robert. It's fine. So were we back on my screen? Yes. Do I need to share again? <laughs> no, no, just, uh, I, I think you uh, you was trying to transition the slides from the webinar window instead of your PowerPoint. Oh, I got you. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. Okay, let's start to talk about metal detection. Uh, I mean, obviously there was a, a lot of people that currently have those systems in place, but hopefully we'll be able to supply you with a little bit of information as to how those systems are actually functioning, what sort of things they can and can't do, and really how to implement them into a good program, not just relying on a piece of equipment, but also implementing that and having good processes built around that equipment. Uh, most systems out there today are what we consider a balanced coiled metal detector system. They work off of a conductive principle, meaning anything of a conductive nature that passes through the detector will have an effect on its output. Uh, therefore, they're not typically utilized in uh, environments where, say, the packaging material itself may have a conductive nature, like a heavy foil packaging or a metallized film packaging. Uh, fortunately, these systems can be adapted throughout the process in, in several different applications. There's some examples of some metal detector systems there on the screen. We have a pipeline system for like liquids and slurries and pumped products, conveyor systems for either bulk or packaged product moving down a conveyor line, and then free-falling applications where the product would be free-falling like a, a grain or a rice or something of that nature, snack foods between a, uh, a multi-head weighing scale and a bagging system where the product would be dropped through the system and identify any potential contamination that would be in that material as it passes through the detector. So basically what the detector is doing is it's looking at 
a change in voltage as a conductive material travels through the detector. You can see that little sphere traveling through the coil arrangement at the bottom of the screen, creating that bar graph to go into the detection signal. Well, basically what happens is we're monitoring an output voltage on the metal detector. And when a conductive material travels through there, it creates an amplification of that voltage. So a couple of things are going to affect that voltage or the, in fact the sensitivity in regards to contamination. Uh, you can see those voltage thresholds. As long as the signal is below the threshold, it's not considered a detection. So the first example there where we're only in the green bars and where that voltage is not surpassing the detection threshold, uh, that could be say a one millimeter piece of ferrous not enough to cause a detection. Whereas the second example would be a 1.5 millimeter piece of ferrous. A bigger piece creates a bigger voltage and a bigger output and allows easier detection. The other thing as far as contamination that could affect it would be the type of material. So, and based on its conductive nature, since ferrous is more conductive than stainless steel, it's typically easier to detect. So the first example where we're not getting a detection could be a one millimeter piece of stainless steel, not enough con conductive nature to cause a detection. Whereas on the right side, that would be the signal generated from a one millimeter piece of ferrous, the same ball size, but of a different material type. So it's important to understand that there is a difference in sensitivity, not only between the, the various metals, but also that some products may have a conductive nature to them, uh, high moisture percentage, high salt content, high temperature, all increase the conductive nature of the product itself. So we have to make an adjustment to the detector so that it can successfully inspect product. In fact, when people say, hey, Robert, how do you set up a metal detector? The answer is you set it up to successfully run production. I'm not necessarily setting the detector up to see a particular metal type or size. My goal is, is that 100% of the good product is able to successfully pass through the detector without creating a false detect. We'll talk more about false detects and why those can be uh, you know, very detrimental to the business uh, in a few slides here. We define the sensitivity of the metal detector as the smallest diameter metal sphere of a specific metal that is detected in the center of the detector's aperture or opening. Basically, the center of the detector, no matter how big it is, what shape it is, the absolute center of that opening is going to be the weakest point for detection. So when we're challenging the detector with our metal test spheres, that should actually be the area that I'm targeting for that sphere to travel through. If it detects it in the center of the detector, in the detector's weakest area, it will detect that size and type material anywhere it falls within that entire detector space or wherever it may, may be lying in relationship to the product itself. So that is truly the area that we target for when we're performing challenges and tests on the detector to ensure we know exactly what the system is capable of detecting. Another factor involved is, is, as far as sensitivity and what affects the sensitivity would be the physical size of the detector. The larger the opening, the less sensitive it is. Uh, this is one of, as an equipment manufacturer, this is one of our, our most challenging areas. It's been very rare occasion where I've gone into a, a manufacturing facility where they run 100 different products and they have 100 different individual production lines to run those products on. Most often we're running several different products down an individual production line and therefore we have to size the detector large enough to fit the largest product that is going to be running down that particular line. So as you can see here, the smallest detector on top, 500 millimeters wide by 125 millimeters high, is able to detect a one millimeter in the center. Uh, 
However, the largest detector, the 500 millimeter wide by 225 millimeter high, can only detect 1.5 millimeter in the center of the detector. Again, the bigger the detector, the less sensitive it is. We ideally want to size the detector so that it's sized appropriately for the particular product that's running through there in order to get the best sensitivities for detection of the metal contamination. This will give you an idea of the characteristics within a metal type that are uh, make it able to be detected in the metal detector. The magnetic permeability and the electrical conductivity are the two factors that allow the material to be detected. In ferrous metal, it is both magnetic and a good electrical conductor, so it is very easy for the detector to identify those type contaminations. Non-ferrous materials such as aluminum, copper, brass, lead, bronze, zinc, uh, they're semi-magnetic. They are still good electrical conductors, so they're kind of in the middle of the road where they're relatively easy to detect. And then unfortunately, probably the most prevalent material in a manufacturing environment uh, and the one that we're most concerned with is the most difficult to detect. Stainless steel is non-magnetic. It's not a very good electrical conductor, and so therefore it's, it is relatively difficult and challenging for the system to detect those. Now that doesn't always hold true. Certainly any detector set at its maximum sensitivity, ferrous will be easiest and stainless will be most difficult. But when we introduce product into that equation, that story can change. I always use an example of flour. If I have regular unenriched flour, it's dry, it's non-conductive, it's able to go through the detector at a very high sensitivity where ferrous will be easiest and stainless will be most difficult. But on that same production line, I also run an iron fortified flour that has a ferrosulfate additive, basically a ferrous material. Now that product itself is mimicking the signal that ferrous produces Therefore, I'm having to make an adjustment to the detector to desensitize it to the product so that I can run the product successfully. And in that case, I'm making it more challenging to see ferrous material. Not that it won't detect any ferrous material. I'm just going to need a larger piece in that condition. So it's not necessarily what the detector can do. It's what the product allows us to do. Setting a system up very sensitive to see a smaller contamination with an end result of having a very high false reject rate is not a good situation. That false reject rate is going to uh, relate to increased uh, man hours to rework that product, potentially product waste if we're just simply throwing it away, and worse yet, probably is the confidence level of the people that are operating around the system. If they see that it's activating quite frequently, but yet they're not finding contamination, their, their confidence in that system's ability to do what they want it to do drops very low. And in some cases can lead them to even circumventing the reject device and running product without inspection at all, which is really never recommended. There's really one thing to grasp from this presentation is understanding orientation effect. We test metal detectors with these nice perfect little BBs or spheres of metal. Well, those spheres, they don't exhibit any orientation effect. I can run that sphere in any direction of travel and it will have the same effect on the detector because of its spherical shape. However, real world contamination, like a piece of wire, is going to exhibit what we call an orientation effect, where in one direction it will be easy to detect. If you turn that wire 90 degrees, it becomes more difficult to detect. This is due to the nature of the, the physics that are involved with the magnetic field and how that magnetic field interacts with different material types. So some 
facilities where they have identified uh, non-spherical type contamination as a major concern. An example would be a, an injection needle going into marinate a meat. Uh, in those applications, sometimes what facilities do is they put two metal detectors on the system and have them sitting at offsetting angles from one another, therefore improving the opportunity to detect an orientation type incident where it's a non-spherical contamination. This is the other reason why I want to set the system to successfully run production and minimize any kind of false reject activity. You could imagine the product being a uh, loose product in a bag. And the first time that pa the product passes through the detector, there's a piece of ferrous wire in an orientation in this direction where the detector does its job. It detects it and it rejects that product. But if I have a high level of false rejects and I don't have confidence that the detector is doing a good job, I may rework that product and rerun it through the detector. However, on rerunning the detector, the contamination, or rerunning the product, the contamination has shifted its direction and now it goes through the detector undetected. If you are going to rework a rejected product, ideally you do that in an offline system that is smaller where we can control the product flow a little bit easier to identify where that contamination is. Or if you are going to run it through the same detector, you rework that through that detector several times. Trying to change the orientation of the product if possible, turning the product upside down, rerunning it through there five or six or seven different times to ensure that it is in fact not contaminated prior to allowing that to be reintroduced into the production flow. Again, ideally it would be an offline inspection, but if you do do an online inspection, be sure that you are absolutely confident that that product is not a uh, result of a false reject and it is truly contaminated. Metal detectors are primarily a receiving device. So they are susceptible to environmental conditions such as airborne electrical interferences, uh, plant vibration, temperature fluctuations. Um, sometimes uh, you can get an interference from your two-way uh, radios that are utilized within the facility. If you are operating that radio very close to the opening of the detector, that could create a detection signal. Now, Newer detectors have better filtering circuits in them. They are more stable. Uh, the electronics are better. There's better shielding on the cabling and things of that nature. So newer detectors uh, aren't as susceptible to these issues as older detectors are. But I always like to make that a point that it's, it's ideally you're able to run the metal detector at its most maximum sensitivity in the environment in which it's supposed to operate. The only thing that should force you to turn down sensitivity is the product itself. Any of these other conditions, rather than desensitizing the detector, it's best to locate the source of these problems and solve the problem at the source so that you can optimize the performance of the detector and run it at the maximum possible sensitivity to detect the smallest possible contamination. So that was a little introduction with metal detection systems. Now we'll go in to talk about x-rays a little bit. And x-rays are totally different than metal detectors. Not only can they detect other things, uh, but there are less influences from the environment that have an effect on them, including influences from the product and the packaging itself. X-ray systems are based on a density principle basically looking for variation in density in the product in order to identify the contamination. They do not work on a conductive principle like metal detection systems. Therefore, uh, they are suitable for applications where we are running conductive packaging. Again, metalized film, foil pans, 
Uh, the product itself can have a high conductive nature, very high liquid, high temperature, high salt content, and it has very little influence on the sensitivity of the x-ray system. Not only can we detect uh, metal type contaminations, but the x-ray systems can look for other dense materials such as glass, stone, some high density plastics, We'll talk a little bit later about what the systems can and cannot see, um, but x-ray systems are a little bit different as far as application from a metal detection system, where a metal detection system, we did have a gravity-fed application for free-falling products. There is not an application in x-ray for free-falling products. We can do bulk on a conveyor, we can do package on a conveyor, and we can do liquids or pumped product uh, through a pipeline system. But again, there is no gravity fed type application available for an x-ray. It has to do with the speed of the product and the scanning rate of the x-ray system. It's very difficult to control a free falling product speed and therefore it makes it very challenging in x-ray applications. The general layout of x-rays is we have a gen, uh, an x-ray generator where we're actually generating x-rays. Uh, and we do this through a, a, a vacuum tube as opposed to having some sort of radioactive source in the detector. There is no radioactive source. Uh, these things are very, very safe to operate. They are very um, strict regulations. Uh, around the globe as to these sort of devices, how they have to have certain protections built in, like interlock circuits on all of the doors and access panels. The lamp stack has to be there so that these, uh, you have a visual uh, identification when x-rays are being generated. Um, so this just gives you a kind of a general layout of those systems. Again, the way we generate x-rays is in a vacuum tube where we have a high potential on one side, we apply power, and electrons are attracted to a target. When the electrons uh, impact that target, basically two things are created. One is heat, the other is x-ray photons. Uh, the majority of that energy that was uh, created was is heat generation, which we need to dissipate through the means of cooling systems. Uh, now we have systems that don't require a cooling system because they are very low power x-ray systems, so they do not generate a lot of heat. But uh, older systems may have cooling systems involved. 2% of that energy only. Again, very inefficient, but very safe. If I turn off the power to the x-ray tube, the x-rays stop. There's no residual x-ray energy left over. Uh, they simply halt. So it's not like, again, there's some sort of material in there that is constantly creating this x-ray energy. The only time x-ray energies will be created is when we have power applied to the system. Some of that energy will be absorbed by the product due to its density the remaining energy will be able to pass through that product and reach a detector below, which is registering uh, the data. So here's an example of a good package for an x-ray application, a heavy foil type bag, very conductive, maybe not suitable for a metal detector, but in an x-ray application, it doesn't care about these sort of products. As that material moves through the x-ray beam and across the detector, an image is created. That image is created and made up of several individual pixels where each pixel will have a numeric value based on a grayscale. We can see where there is no product area, the image is very light in color. Those pixels would have a very high numeric value. Then we can see the area where the packaging material starts to enter the shading is getting a little bit darker, and then all the way to the most darkest areas of the product, the most dense areas of the product, those individual pixels would have a lower numeric value. The system simply is comparing each pixel to the surrounding pixel and comparing its numeric value. If it sees a large difference based on the sensitivity settings, 
it may identify that particular pixel or area as a contamination source. So this chart will give you an idea of materials that are detected and materials that aren't detected or that may be more challenging to detect. It's all based on what the specific gravity. When we talk about specific gravity, it's basically the ratio of density of a substance compared to the, to the density of the same volume of substance. So we use water as our substance typically as, as kind of the, the benchmark. And if you compared water to say humid hair, human hair only has a value of 0.32, whereas water has a value of one. If you were to drop a piece of human hair into a glass of water, it would float. Likewise, uh, if you were to drop a piece of stainless steel into the water, it would sink very rapidly to the bottom. Specific gravity for stainless steel is eight times, nearly eight times as dense as water. That's why it sinks very rapidly. Now this is not a 100% test but it's a fair assumption as to whether or not a material would be able to be detected in an x-ray system. If you drop it in a glass of water and it floats, chances are very unlikely that it will be detected. If it sinks very rapidly to the bottom of that glass of water, however, the chances are relatively high that we're able to detect that sort of material. It is always going to depend on the product itself but this is a good gauge as to whether or not a material would be even likely to be seen in an x-ray. So things like hair and insects, we have good prerequisite programs built within our food safety programs to deal with those issues. When we walk into the facility on the production floor, we have to put on a hair net. If we have a beard, we have to put on beard nets. We have good insect programs to prevent insect infestation into the facility. You can see wood. Wood is a very hard object, but it's not a very dense object. Very challenging for that to be seen in an x-ray application. Therefore, uh, not only because it's difficult to identify from a physical contamination perspective, but it's also very porous and can harbor bacteria and things of that nature. So we're starting to see less and less wood within the production environment. Now we're getting into some of the plastics, polypropylene, PP, a type of plastic that is very commonly used in production. UHMW, another type of plastic, nylon. Often we see uh, product recalls due to small pieces of blue nylon plastic material in the product. Those materials would be very challenging for x-rays to identify. It has to be a very dense plastic, like a PVC. PVC stands for polyvinyl chloride. It's actually the chloride within the PVC that makes it more visible in an x-ray system. What we are starting to see is some uh, plastic manufacturers beginning to manufacture what they call x-ray detectable plastics, where they're putting an additive into the plastic to make it more visible within the x-ray system. Um, I always caution people against those sort of things to truly understand what the detection capability will be. Don't just simply go and replace all your plastic with x-ray detectable plastic. Understand to what level you're going to be able to successfully detect that material. Oftentimes we're looking for a small scraping of that plastic as opposed to maybe a two millimeter by two millimeter cube of that plastic. So it's important to understand what we can and what we cannot detect. As you get into more of those materials that are detectable by x-ray, bone, stone, and glass, you can see that they have a very similar specific gravity number. Again, it's very important to understand what type of bone we are speaking of, what type of stone, what type of glass, because there are different considerations for those materials. Bones can be challenging. When you think of uh, bone in poultry, well, poultry is processed at a very young age, typically eight weeks to 12 weeks. There's not a whole lot of calcification that has been able to develop in a poultry bone 
and it is more difficult to detect than say a pork bone where it is processed at a later age where there has been opportunity for calcification to occur. It's actually the calcification in the bone that makes it visible within the x-rays. You can sometimes on raw product detect bone easier than you can on cooked product. Typically when we cook a product you are cooking calcification out of the bone making it more challenging to detect. If you look at the metals down towards the bottom we have aluminum, iron, steel, and stainless steel. Well iron, steel, and stainless steel 7.1 to 7.9 very similar specific gravities but if you look at aluminum uh, it is a very low dense type metal so it is more challenging to see aluminum in a x-ray system than it would be to see say stainless steel or ferrous material in an x-ray system so again it's always important to understand to what level we are going to be able to detect these materials that may be of a concern it's also important to again reiterate that to set the system up to successfully run production and minimize false rejects because of all the benefits you get from reducing waste, improving efficiencies, and truly understanding to what level you are able to protect that product through the solution of an inspection device. Uh, X-ray systems, because we are really just analyzing an image, can do other quality type inspections. We can analyze that image and not only look for the contamination, but we can also look at that image and ensure maybe all the pieces are in the, in the package, looking at accounting capability. If there's supposed to be six biscuits in the box, we can tell if there are in fact six biscuits in the box. Because the image is being analyzed based on the grayscale, to a certain degree we can tell the mass of the product as well. So we can relate the mass to also a weight uh, characteristic. The darker the image, the heavier the, the product. The lighter the image, the lighter the product. Not typically used in uh, applications where we have to abide by local weights and measures type regulation. Uh, but certainly a gross overfill, underfill type application, uh, we could use that sort of, of process to, to, to look at that product. We can also mask out certain areas. That's an example of a loaf of bread with a metal bread tie. We're ignoring the metal part of the bread tie so that we can set sensitivities higher in other areas of the product. So we can we can adjust sensitivity based on certain zones, if you will, within the product space itself. I got another poll question here. Uh, just kind of, we saw that some people have bow, some people have metal detection, some people have x-ray. Curious to understand where in the facility these systems are lo uh, located. Do we, do we have them located in, say, the raw material area where we're looking at raw material ingredients? Do we have them in the batching or blending area? Do we have them in after or before a grinder, cutting, maybe some further processing application? Or is most of them at the end of the production line, after it's in the final packaging? Okay, Robert, I've loaded that in the sidebar. <clears throat> and as we can see, uh, the vast majority, 80% roughly, packaging, stroke end of line, 10% approximately raw materials, and then four batching and blending, six grinding, cutting off further processing. Is that what you expected to see, Robert? Yeah, that's pretty common. Uh, historically, that's where we've really focused the attention is at the end of the line. Uh, and, and certainly to, to, to some degree it makes sense uh, because the product is in a final packaging, the likelihood of further contamination is drastically reduced. So it certainly is a fantastic point to, to inspect the product. However, you know, looking at other areas within the production environment, um, it's, it's important to, to look at those areas as well. So now we'll kind of transition into 
well, how do we choose the best technology? Now we have an understanding of maybe what the system is capable of doing, what it can't do, uh, some of the restrictions as far as the system types available. So let's look at, uh, you know, how to kind of go about making this, the decision as to where to place these sort of systems. We'll look at a, a typical production environment where we have some raw materials coming in from different sources. We're going to maybe put those into a certain batch and maybe blend or mix those products. There may be a cutting or a grinding stage for further processing. And then at the end of the line, really applying that HACCP mentality where we're going through and we're trying to uh, identify potential hazards throughout the process and then find a way to control that. I think a lot of times with that end of the line uh, inspection only, it's difficult to determine where that contamination was introduced into the product. If I only have an end of the line inspection, the opportunity for that, pro to, for that product to have become contaminated with the contamination, I have to look back throughout the entire value chain, even back through my suppliers of raw material as potential sources for that contamination. The other factor that I look at at the end of the line uh, inspection, if, if I'm inspecting that product only at the end of the line and it is in fact contaminated, now, not only am I rejecting the product, but I'm rejecting the, the packaging material. I'm rejecting all of the effort and energy and time and resource it took to manufacture that product. I'm rejecting all of the raw materials that it took to make up that product. And again, trying to figure out where the heck that material came from becomes very challenging. However, if I have a system in that raw material stage where say uh, I'm, I'm having product free flowing through a gravity fed type metal detector, if I get a detect event, I'm rejecting a small amount of product. Therefore, as that product moves on to the batching or blending stage, I know that any contamination that is introduced after this point is going to not have come from the raw material source. I'm not fully investing everything into that product to simply find out that I have a raw material supplier supplying me with contaminated product and I am rejecting not only again the entire product but the packaging, the value that I've entered into that product and everything. So don't just focus on the end of the line, very important space to have a system, but also look at other stages throughout the process. Maybe I want to introduce an inspection system prior to the grinding stage. You can imagine having a contamination in a chunk of frozen meat that's going into a grinder. If it has contamination, could potentially cause damage, very expensive damage to that grinding machine. And that contamination is very likely to get ground up into smaller, more difficult to detect sizes as it goes through that process. So again, let's look at the entire value chain and assess where is the best location to put systems and identify what value you will get by placing it in that location and using that as part of the decision-making process as well. The application is going to be very important, not only from a detection standpoint, but also from a product handling standpoint and a rejection standpoint. So uh, different reject styles where you might have a physical pusher pushing off a package product, retracting belts or end flap type reject devices for bulk products that may be going down a conveyor belt. Again, that pumped application for liquids, slurries, and pumped product where we have the product being pumped through an internal pipe and you have a reject valve that's going to move to a reject position or an accept position based on the quality of that product. And then again, those dry free falling applications, only available in metal detection, not available for a free falling application in an x-ray application. Not only can you have these uh, different areas, but on an x-ray system, say bulk product traveling down a conveyor belt, 
you can actually zone out the span of that entire conveyor belt and only reject the portion that is contaminated where the rest of the material across that belt is able to continue on through to further production. So a lot of diversity and capability but the application and where these systems are going to be, how we're going to handle that product, and how we're going to be able to reject any contaminated product is also uh, important uh, criteria in that decision-making process. And this is a very, very, very simplistic decision tree. Uh, certainly, I wouldn't choose this holistically, uh, but it gives you a general idea. Uh, you know, is the product fed by gravity? Well, if the answer is yes, metal detection is really the only solution from an ex uh, from an electronic perspective. Certainly, you could have that free falling product go through screens or sieves or magnets, but it's important to have processes built around them as well. Are you doing pull strength tests on the magnet? Are you inspecting the screens and the sieves for damage? If they are damaged. Where did that material go? And can a metal detector or an x-ray system further down the line identify that piece of screen that has broken off and fallen into the product flow? If it's not gravity fed, well, that opens up a few more opportunities for us. Is it packaged in a, in a metalized film or a foil packaging? If yes, maybe x-ray is a better solution for you because, again, the conductive nature of that packaging having an impact in a metal detection application. If it's not packaged in any kind of foil material, you know, do we need to detect any other type of contaminations other than metal? If yes, maybe x-ray. If no, we're just looking for metal in that particular application, well, then a metal detector very well may be able to, to, to fulfill that need. So again, very, very simplistic, general kind of overview of what a decision tree might look like in making that determination. So we're really looking at, first off, identifying your hazard. What sort of hazards can be in place? Um, you know, what, where are they come, potentially coming from? Ideally, if you identify a hazard, you can eliminate the hazard. Get it out of there. Get it out of the production environment. If you can't eliminate the potential for that hazard, then at least try to prevent that hazard. Maybe it's a piece of uh, uh, equipment that keeps falling off and falling into the product space. Well, let's try to prevent that by doing more frequent maintenance on that particular equipment. If I can't eliminate it and I can't prevent it, my last chance to, 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 to deal with it is to detect it through a, some sort of inspection device. But it's important to understand what is that hazard? What's the best technology to identify that hazard? Where's the best location within the facility to put a system to get the best result and, and possibility to identify that particular hazard? Metal detectors, again, working on a conductive basis, so only going to detect conductive materials. It's not going to detect a glass or a stone or a plastic. X-rays, however, based on density, can see materials other than metal, can see metal or uh, glass materials, can see bone can see plastics, but again, it's very subjective as to those sort of materials and very important to do product testing to understand truly where to what level we're able to detect those materials that we've identified as potential risks. Looking at the position within the process, am I going to be able to easily go through a root cause analysis when the system identifies a contamination and figuring out where that contamination was introduced. That's the goal. These systems are not contamination elimination devices. They are notification devices. There are ways that materials can make it past these systems. If it's smaller than what it's set to detect, it will pass through the system. So therefore, when it does identify that there is a potential problem, it's important to understand what we do about it that makes the difference. When we know where it's coming from, we put a preventive and a corrective measure in place to prevent it from happening. That is the trend of regulation, going from a reactive state to a preventive mindset. And again, let's look throughout the production environment. Is there a benefit of having an inspection in the raw material stage versus just simply having an end-of-the-line inspection? 
I think that's all I've got. I'm ready for some questions. Okay, Robert. Fantastic. Uh, you've managed in you know 50 minutes to uh, disseminate a very complex subject into a pra very practical and easy to digest uh, way. So uh, thanks very much for that. Um, and you you have stimulated a lot of questions. So if we've got 10 minutes or so, just to pick through uh, some of these quickly, if that's okay. Ripali is asking, what is the best option for a chicken processing plant? Really depends on what part of the chickens we're processing and where it is. Uh, certainly metal detection is good for that inspection as well as x-ray. Uh, if it is a fresh chicken, uh, typically meat type products, have a conductive nature to them. Uh, so there may be benefits in going to a x-ray system. Certainly if we're looking for bone type contamination, a metal detector would not be able to detect that. There are new systems being introduced today that are multi-simultaneous frequency detectors where we have seen an improvement in metal detection for those challenging applications like a chicken and poultry process. So really either technology would work. Uh, which one's going to be better? It's very difficult to say. It depends on the ability to control that product. Uh, if there's very little control of that product, say in the amount of product that's going through there, maybe a multi-simultaneous frequency type detector would be the solution or an x-ray system. Okay, super. Uh, Diane Burgess Ibsen has asked, how do we detect rust? Indeed. Yep. So, uh, you know, when you talk about things like, again, more realistic type contaminations, like a rust flake or something like that, uh, it, it, it depends on the size of the material in the product. It's difficult for me to say, yes, we can detect it or no, we can't. In some applications, certainly we'll be able to detect very small amounts of, of contamination materials, even down to small flakes of rust. Um, but it all depends on the application. Again, in a metal detector, the larger the detector is, the more challenging it is to see. So if I have an end of the line inspection process where I'm trying to run a large case of product, inspection for a small flake of rust would be very difficult. But if I'm running an individual product through a very small detector, the detection at that point would certainly be easier. Um, so it's difficult to say yes we could or no we couldn't. It depends on the size and the application as always. Okay, uh, let's have a look. Uh, Karma, uh, it's quite a long one this Robert. As an auditor I find many facilities that calibration of metal detectors, they just pass the test pieces and record on a certificate if successful or not. However, I know this is not acceptable as calibration, only a verification. Can you briefly explain the calibration process? So, it's, that, that's, a, that's a great question, uh, one I often get, and, and, and one that's somewhat difficult to, to answer because uh, some one person's perception of what calibration is versus somebody else's may be different. The way that I view it is, is a metal detector cannot be calibrated. Um, because calibrations typically are to be done to an internationally recognized type standard. Whereas there isn't a standard. A metal detector is not like a scale. A scale, I can get a certified set of weights I can place the weight on the scale if it's supposed to read five ounces and it reads three ounces. I can calibrate the scale to read appropriately. Metal detector is not like that. It's not like I'm running a one millimeter piece of ferrous through there and saying you should see this as a one millimeter piece of ferrous. We do calibrate the settings to the detector to the product in means in terms of successfully setting the detector up to successfully run production. We, what we do during an annual performance verification on a system uh, when a technician comes in there is we are certifying the system. 
we're certifying the system is operating to factory standards. So there are some internal electronics that we're looking at and possibly adjusting. There is some tuning factors that are involved that we're looking at and adjusting, but we're not necessarily calibrating it as per what is required from an international perspective. There just simply isn't an internationally recognized process for calibration. Okay. So we say we certify systems annually. Those tests of running samples through there, you're absolutely right. They are verification activities. There should also be good validation activities surrounding it where we're running uh, a series of tests through the detector to understand truly what is capable of being detected. Again, targeting that center location as the weakest area. Okay, great. Um, would that go for x-ray as well? Wow, uh, x-rays as well, a little bit different though as far as the weakest area of an x-ray because there can be a lot of uh, varying densities within the product itself. It's not necessarily saying, hey, target the center area. So with x-rays, typically what we do is we, we test the sample closest to the x-ray source and then closest to the detector. On a top-down system, that would be one on top of the product and one underneath the product. And that would get us basically an understanding of capability. Okay, thanks, Robert. Uh, Lindsay, uh, would x-rays successfully detect ceramic packaging, i.e. small party food products? So ceramics uh, can act as a, it's mineral type stone. Um, in fact, some facilities use a ceramic bead when they make a stone test sample. So it really depends. If we're trying to ignore that product, certainly we can set up the detector to ignore characteristics within that product. Uh, what we're doing in turn is desensitizing it. So if we were looking for a small piece of ceramic inside a piece of ceramic, of course, makes it more challenging. Uh, another example for that sort of uh, relationship would be a, a glass inspection, where we're looking at a glass bottle filled with product and looking for a chip of that glass to maybe have broken off during the capping process. We can mask certain areas of the product off and just look at the body of the product for those contamination sources and ignore the packaging. So that is possible. And that's great because you've managed to uh, uh, hit the target with the uh, next question because Martin did ask, is it possible to detect glass fragments in a glass bottle of juice with x-ray? So that's great. <laughs> yeah, a lot is really going to be, you know, there's different x-rays and there's different... Uh, angles of x-rays. So if we have a simple straight across the product area, there are going to be areas of that bottle that get masked. So it's going to be more difficult to find a contamination in that particular zone or area of the bottle. So you can have multiple beam inspection systems where there's multiple angles for visual reference where it exposes a lot of those areas. So we do have systems that are particularly designed for glass in glass type inspections. Uh, not only looking for the contamination, but we can also verify that the fill level of that particular product is at the appropriate level. We can look at the uh, integrity of the cap and make sure that it's properly aligned. So there's a lot of capabilities uh, other than just the contamination in those inspections as well. Okay, sounds great. Um, Dave, what is the smallest footprint uh, anyone is using for x-ray? Okay, good question. Uh, and again, don't have a specific uh, answer for you. There are regulations around the x-ray system. So one of the requirements as far as its design is it has to be designed in a fashion to where nobody can insert a part of the human body into the primary beam. Uh, again, we are dealing with x-rays. We are dealing with a radiation type environment. So there are some precautions uh, to take care of when we deal with x-rays. Again, I don't want to put the fear of anyone in there, but I also don't want anybody sticking their hand into the primary beam where they could potentially expose themselves to potentially a radiation burn if they left their hand in there for a long period of time. So it really depends on the application. If I have a very short product, I can put shielding up 
and therefore I can't stick any part of the human body past that shield, therefore the system can be a lot smaller in its shape. But if I had a very large opening where I could physically step inside of that detector, now I would have to ensure that it's designed large enough so that I couldn't stick my hand all the way through the system and reach that primary beam. So the answer is then it depends. <laughs> very much so, very much so. Okay, I think I can answer this one. Uh, uh, Imran, can x-ray detect pests or flies? Am I right to say no? You are correct. Uh, typically organic dense. type materials, uh, things like uh, insect legs, pieces and parts. Uh, it's, it's the x-ray system is, is the, those, there's not enough absorption in those materials from the x-ray. So the x-rays simply pass right through them with, with very, resi very little resistance. Okay, what about cartilage? Rupal is asking cartilage. Yes, yeah, so especially when we talk in poultry type applications, uh, that's always a concern. People say, hey, can it detect bone? Sure, it can detect bone. Well, what about this little piece of cartilage here? Um, like off of a fan bone is often what they call it. Uh, typically, those materials aren't seen in, in the applications where they're employed to, 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 to run that test. Uh, we have to generate enough x-ray energy to get through the product. So you can imagine a, a chicken breast or something has some amount of density and thickness to it. So I've got to generate enough energy to, to penetrate through that where small fan bone and cartilage, the x-ray energy is just able to get right through them because of its power level. Um, it's very much application. If I had a bunch of chicken breasts just laying all over the conveyor belt and I'm looking for a piece of cartilage, very, very low chances. If I had a single chicken breast that every breast was going through there, very sequenced and very oriented and very consistent, I'll be able to set the energy levels a little bit better for sensitivity and increase the level of detecting that. So with x-rays, there's, there's a lot less uh, guesswork involved. Really, it does involve running a product test with that particular product to, again, we want to truly understand what the capability is. I don't want to give anybody a false hope out there. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible, but depending on the application. Yeah. And if somebody was uh, sort of uh, interested in, in seeing, exploring whether it is possible or not without the expenditure, how, how do you go about that? Yeah, we, we, we try to, I mean, obviously we understand the, uh, the capital investment that it, that it takes to implement these, these systems into these processes, not only with uh, procuring the product itself, but also taking and in in rearranging the production environment to fit these devices in there. We understand that there's a lot of expense involved. Uh, we have a product test lab in our Tampa facility where people can send products in there. We do product testing on several different systems. We can do it both on metal detection and x-ray and see what the results are and provide a report to people. And we do that free of charge. Uh, we also have two full-size motor coaches that travel around the country every year uh, where we do food safety seminars at certain regional events and we have equipment on the bus. People can bring their products to those events and we can test the products on the machine. Uh, we have another motor coach that goes around to the individual plants themselves and we schedule plant visits. So if, there's, if that's something that somebody's interested in, we can certainly do that. Again, I do realize that we have a very diverse group here and global group here. So it's, I can't drive my motor coach to China, unfortunately. <laughs> but we do have representation around the world. Uh, we are a global organization. So uh, very likely in, in a lot of these territories and regions, we do have uh, uh, resources for them to send in product and perform tests at. That's great. It's a good service. Um, right. Let, let me just say, we're on five past the hour. Uh, I've, I have loaded the certificate in the sidebar if, anybody, if any attendee needs to get off quickly. But are you all right to stay for five minutes or so, Robert? Yeah, sure. No problem. Okay. Okay, so if you do need to get away, we appreciate we schedule it for an hour. If you need to go away to work, you've got your certificate in the sidebar and it is being recorded today so you can catch up later. Uh, but we'll just carry on with the questions merrily for those of you who want to stay. Uh, Wayne is asking, what is the break point for X-ray uh, close to the UHMW at 1.15? 
one point. <laughs> Can you see that question that Wayne's put in the sidebar? So I'll, I'll assume that he's speaking of the specific gravity number. UHMW is kind of like on the, on the cusp of being dense enough to be detected or not. Um, so, so it's a little bit more dense than water. So yes, a, a piece of it will, will float or will sink in a, in a glass of water. So it's, it's potentially detectable by an x-ray. To give you an example, if I had a small uh, foil pouch of say a powder flavoring, very low density, if I had a piece of UHMW in that product, very likely I would be able to detect it. However, if I had, again, uh, a case of uh, ribs where it's bone-in product, there's a lot of density and diversity and, and contrast within that product itself, uh, a piece of UHMW in that case would probably not be likely to be detected. So, again, it's always going to be based on the product and the application. Uh, we can tune the detectors a little bit. Uh, and, and optimize them for the particular inspection, but it's, it is, it's going to be for that particular application, for that particular product. The more consistent I can get that product through the detector, the more uh, sensitive I can set the system. The more inconsistencies that happen, even though they may be acceptable inconsistencies, uh, the more challenging it is to set up a system very sensitive because I have to allow all that diversity. I don't want when an inconsistency comes through during normal production and it's not a contaminated product for that product to get falsely rejected. Yeah, that sense. increases the waste, reduces those efficiencies, reduces the confidence in the, in the system itself. Uh, and those are all very, very detrimental to uh, very much detrimental to the program. Okay. Uh, I think you've answered Naranga Chai's, can we detect soft bone? We've covered that about bone and cartilage. Imran, can we use the x-ray for bulk packaging? Example, 10 kilogram box of baguette frozen products. Uh, there are case inspection systems available uh, for very large applications. Again, you can you, you, you typically can run into the situation where the larger we go in a product, uh, the less sensitive overall the system is going to be. And again, look at it from a perspective of what happens when we do find a contamination in those bulk type products. We're rejecting the entire bulk product where it may be only a small section or a single individual piece of product in that entire case that is contaminated. You'll get much better inspection if we can look at it in the individual product state prior to it going into the case and then from a, uh, a risk perspective, all we have to do is a risk analysis from that individual detector to the end of the line. And in most cases in that space, contamination risks are very low. There's no further processing, no grinding, no mixing, no blending. And if it can, contamination sources are normally from the environment, very large pieces of contamination, a bolt falling off, a filler nozzle falling off, where inspection in a case detector would be very easy to detect those sort of materials. Yeah. Okay. Um, Alicia is saying, can you also mask by partic particulate size, e.g. a glass shard piece in salsa with mostly uniform particulate sizes? Uh, you can do some shape recognition through, a, through an x-ray system, but that would be more so looking at, a, say, a candy bar. I'm looking at the width of the candy bar. I'm looking at the length of the candy bar to make sure that in in its full size, all the pieces or parts are in there. It's not half a candy bar. Um, when we're talking about particulates in a product itself, obviously that creates varying densities within the product itself. Um, as far as saying, okay, I've got a cube perfect cube of an onion chunk in my salsa, can I look at an irregular shaped material and, and identify that as a shard? Um, no, not really. It's going to, again, be based on the density. So if that glass in that salsa uh, created enough contrast due to the glass's density versus the salsa's density, then yes, we would be able to detect it. Um, and again, so now I'm, I'm, I'm kind of looking at those applications typically in a bagged product, uh, probably very likely. 
in a glass jar where the salsa is placed into a glass jar. It's going to be based if you had a system that was designed for jar inspection with those multi-beam and those multiple visual angles of the product, then very likely to detect those sort of contaminations. Glass is a very detectable material. Yeah. Okay, Kirsten, um, she's got a, a solid product, chocolate, that's going through a metal detector. So it's not practical to, to embed the test wand in the center. Uh, so she's saying uh, our wand's placed over, under, beside uh, for adequate testing. Uh, what's the best? method yep so as far as metal detection is concerned and and it's 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 somewhat of a misunderstanding even in the world with with auditors have some misunderstanding where that's the expectation i want to know if there's metal in the product well it doesn't matter if it's in the product or out of the product on a metal detector it's more so the relationship with that center point of the opening of the detector that center point is going to be the weakest area. It doesn't matter if it's inside of a product or outside of a product. If it's traveling through the center, that will be the weakest area. So if the bar of chocolate were lower than the center point on the detector, then placing the test sample on top of that bar as it goes through there puts that sample as close to the center as that chocolate bar would ever allow a contamination to be. So that would be the best location. If it's taller than the center point, then they'd want to place it in or on that product. You could attach it to the front of it, to the back of it, uh, or you could embed it into the product. But of course, at that point, most likely you're destroying that product. Um, so I can't say don't do what the auditor asks, uh, because certainly the auditor has uh, you know some value in, in that discussion. But the reality is, is that in a metal detector, it's the center area of the detector that is important. Um, and you can do validation tests to prove that, and, 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 and that should be done. You should do some studies where you ran samples on the top and saw how much bar graph movement you got. You put it on the bottom. You made sure that you could still detect it. You, you know, put it at the leading edge of the product and then at the trailing edge of the product to make sure that it, the reject timing is accurate no matter where the contamination is within that product. All very important steps to do and document to support those discussions when the auditors come in and want you to place it in the middle. Okay, thanks, Robert. Uh, Ehab, what does the, the threshold mean? And what is the number of, it says beers, <laughs> but I think uh, bars. <laughs> maybe, bars in the X. Yeah. So typically on a, on a, on a uh, detection system, you'll have a, a bar graph that goes, say, from the green area where we're not causing a detection, and then there's several segments into the red area where we are causing a detection. Um, the stronger the detection signal, the larger the number of bars that light up. Uh, in reality, you can uh, relate those bars to the voltage that I spoke of, um, where basically the higher the voltage is created from the contamination in a metal detector, the higher signal the bars are going to be. Um, we use that information, and some, t some detectors have the capability of displaying a threshold value or a detection signal strength, uh, where you can utilize that signal strength in some of the decision-making process. If I'm only getting a very slight detection, well, maybe I want to test that system more frequently. But if I'm getting a very strong detection signal, then I know that my system is very sensitive. I'm able to successfully run the product uh, and I'm getting a strong detection signal. Well, maybe I don't have to test that system as frequently so I can save some money in that aspect. Okay, uh, this is a good question. Imran, are there, are there x-rays that you can adjust online and connect with a server that will send a pop-up email when it detects any hazard? Wow. So, um, well, both the metal detection and the x-ray system do have outputs for communication. Uh, that communication output can be tied to an existing factory management software system where it's going to log and time and date stamp any reject activity or any interaction people logging into the system. Uh, we, of course, at Mettler Toledo have our own system. Uh, it's called ProdX that communicates with all of our systems and puts out uh, reporting capabilities based on that. And you can, in fact, have those systems uh, either through a... Uh, 
uh, email type server or an alert where you can get alerts on your phone uh, when an activity occurs and that's somewhat configurable so maybe I don't want to have an alert when somebody logs into the system to make a settings change but I do want to have an alert if I get five detects within a five minute period of time so some of that activity it is possible to configure those outputs and get those notifications Okay, just a, a couple more, Robert. Uh, Kian, which is another interesting question. I work in a sausage processing plant and the metal detector detects salt, which is one of our batching ingredients that gives a false alarm. Any recommendations? Yeah, so salt is, a, is, is, is really unusual as far as in a metal detector. So in its dry state, uh, I can take a mound full of salt and run it through the detector at maximum sensitivity and it will have zero effect on it. The salt is dry. It's really non-conductive in and of itself in its dry form. But if I just take a cup of water and put a pinch of salt into that cup of water, that salt water now is extremely conductive versus a just a regular filtered water. So when that salt gets introduced as an ingredient state, if it is somewhat of a uh, moisture environment or has a liquid uh, context to that product, additive salt can in fact increase that sensitivity and make it more uh, conductive. Um, but again, if it were just a bag of salt, a little pouch of salt versus a five pound bag of salt, really not a whole lot of difference in that state. Um, so salt, if it does affect the um, uh, the, the, the salinity of that product in kind of a moisture perspective then certainly can have an effect. And the best way to do that is if there's a certain level of salt that you accept as good quality product, we want to ensure that when th that product meets that a level of salt that the product that the detector is set to successfully inspect it properly. Uh, again, you want to minimize those false rejects as much as possible. Uh, and reduce that rework time. Okay. Patricia, detecting metal in ham processing. Okay. Metal detector, x-ray inspection, both or neither. <laughs> <laughs> in ham pro de detecting metal in ham processing. What? Ham processing. Um, oh. I would say, again, very much depends. If I'm doing a slicing or a cutting, maybe I want to have a metal detector prior to that slicing and cutting to make sure that if there's any contamination in the product itself, that it doesn't cause damage to the equipment and create uh, maybe a, 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 a sawtooth blade breaking off and creating contamination itself. Um, in a final package state, a lot of times those materials, uh, a ham type product, would be packaged in a material that might have a nice foil embossment on the packaging so it looks really pretty on the display shelf and everything like that. That product being a conductive material, the packaging material, maybe having an x-ray after that. Um, I always look at uh, going through and evaluating number one, the risks. What risks do I have? Where are they at? And, and can I get rid of them? Firstly, you know, ideally, but if I can't get rid of that risk and that risk is always going to be there, what's going to be the best location and the best solution? So it's going to really be based on that risk. If they have glass as a risk, well, I try to get the glass out of there or cover that glass, but if they can't and glass is a potential, well, then x-ray is going to be a solution for them. If they're not worried about those non-conductive type contaminations, they're able to get rid of all those risks and metal is their only concern. Metal detector is a good application for that product as well. Okay. I'm trying to mop up these questions, but we, we might not be able to. Amy is asking, which, which uses the higher voltage uh, metal detector or x-ray machine? Uh, from a perspective of line voltage to power up the system, they can both be either or. I mean, you can have 110 systems, you can have 220 volt systems. Uh, as far as power that's generated. X-rays were generating kilovolts uh, when, we, when we measure X-ray energy. When we're dealing with detectors, we're very, very low energy in that sense. Okay. Uh, the difference between threshold and sensitivity is? 
between the voltage threshold and sensitivity, they're really one and the same. Um, if I wanted to make a detector more sensitive, I'm going to require less voltage to breach the threshold. If I want to make it less sensitive, I'm now requiring more voltage to breach the threshold. So basically, the threshold is what I'm moving as I adjust sensitivity. Okay, no more questions, ladies and gents. Now, uh, Andre, uh, good question. Can Robert comment on detecting voids in product with x-ray like hollow heart disease in potatoes or large low density contaminants that are in product that show, show up as low density areas in the product? E.g. Uh, large, large plastic pieces in chocolate. Yeah, so if I were looking at, say, an application, and we've done voids in products before, again, as, as with most of my answers, very application specific. Um, but one example was a hamburger patty. Uh, in the process where the hamburger patty is being formed, sometimes a piece of hamburger will stick to the former, creating a void in that actual hamburger patty. In those applications, I can tend to find those very easily. Uh, in an application where, um, you know, say maybe a chocolate bar, where there's an area within the chocolate bar that the, the chocolate wasn't... Uh, filled all the way up so as it formed and whatnot there was a little bit of void in that spacing a little bit more challenging um it, it, it again just really depends on the application uh as far as whether we're able to see those irregular uh product quality issues like mis uh, misshapes or voids in a product Okay, just to get you over the line with these last two questions, Robert, uh, Kirsten said, thank you so much, Robert, you rock. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> okay, Chandra is saying, I manufacture pet preform for water bottles. How would x-ray help me to find metal? Okay, so uh, we are starting to see a lot of those applications, uh, packaging material, where we're starting to inspect them where the actual packaging material is being manufactured. And I imagine that stems from a lot of the regulations now looking at risks involving the package. A lot of times they look at the, the any kind of seeping of that material into the product and any kind of issue that might resolve. But certainly physical contamination inside bottle type inspections is, is being done. Uh, a PET type bottle, um, non-conductive. Uh, so therefore, if it doesn't have any kind of foil wrapping or foil lid on it or anything like that, an x-ray system, or I'm sorry, a metal detection system is going to be able to be set very, very sensitive. Your only restriction would be, as far as sensitivity, would be on the physical size of the detector required to, to run that product or case of product through there, whichever the case may be. Uh, x-ray inspection is good as well, um, as well as the vision solution. that You can use a camera-based system where we're looking at uh, the product itself and in a camera based system not only can you look for the contamination but you can also look at the ovality of the 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 the, the, the lid on the uh, uh, on the bottle so when a cap does go on it we're sure that the cap is being secured properly you can look at the the width of the threads on the the the, the throat of the bottle you can do a lot of different inspections with a lot of different machines it's really just what we're looking for what's going to give you the best result at the most value. I mean, we always do want to look at the value. I don't want to give you an x-ray system when a metal detector system at a lower cost point could do the job just as well. So it's the risk, the value, and, and you know, and, and what we're trying to, to, to get out of the system to figure out which is going to be the best system for you. Great. Okay. Final, final question, Michelle. Is your, uh, if your metal contaminants are way bigger than your current test pieces, it creates a distortion in the magnetic field signal. How will you ensure that the contaminant is ejected? Yep, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great point and probably a, a good thing to, to end on because it is a, 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 a critical factor when we're looking at these systems. You can have the most sensitive detector detecting the smallest contamination, but if you can't accurately reject and remove that product or identify it as a contaminated product, well, then it does nobody any good. So it's very important to have a proper system design. Um, so 
that particular problem if the reject is only looking for the metal detection signal as its sole criteria for timing of the reject what can happen when you get a very large contamination is the contamination actually gets detected before it enters the detector opening because it's so large um, and that will affect the reject timing now the reject is opening sooner than it should and it may be staying open for a longer period of time because it does saturate that reject signal and it takes a long time for that signal to recover so what you can do is you can put other points in the process into that calculation for the reject timing. Installing a photo eye in the infeed of the detector. Now you know the point from the photo eye to the rejector, you know the detect for, to the rejector, and you can measure how long that package blocks that photo eye so we now know how big that package is. With all those individual data points given to the system, it can very accurately reject that product regardless of the position or the size of the contamination. The reject device will operate and it will return back to its normal state. It's really one of the challenges you should give your metal detectors is not only can you detect the samples, but what happens when a bolt goes through there? Does it reject that package accurately? Uh, very unlikely that a bolt's gonna fall into your product maybe, but it's good to understand exactly what your system is capable of. Look for those deficiencies in the process and then try to fill those gaps and improve the process. Great, thanks very much. Uh, uh, well, I think we've concluded today, uh, well, we've detected that you rock. <laughs> we have detected that you rock, yeah, attendees. And we hope that you're not sensitive to praise. <laughs> not at all, not at all. Because, I appreciate because, yeah, you deserve some praise because, uh, I mean, this is probably the longest uh, one-hour webinar we've done. So thanks very, very much to, today, Robert. No uh, problem. For st sticking with the questions and, uh, yeah. If it's an exam, you got 10 out of 10 or 100 out of 100. <laughs> Perfect. So, okay, so on behalf of myself, Food Safety Fridays, attendees, IFSQN, uh, thanks very much again. Hope to see you again in the near future. Absolutely. And good luck with the golf this weekend. Yes, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for joining. We'll talk to you soon. All right, cheers. Bye. Right, ladies and gents. Uh, I make no apologies for keeping you beyond the, the time there. Obviously, you, you got the get out clause. You could have left. Uh, your certificate's already loaded in the sidebar. You've got that. Uh, within a couple of hours, we'll follow up with an email and send you the uh, recording, the presentation slides, the certificate. And also, we'll tell you about next week's, uh, well, June the 21st, we've got the uh, commitment Britta Ball, Dr. Britta Ball talking about how to uh, improve commitment, both top down and bottom up in the organization. That's 21st of June. Uh, next week, we've got the practical audit, auditor four hour training next Friday, if you want to sign up for that. Uh, thanks again for your attendance. Uh, happy Friday, have a great weekend, and we'll see you soon. Take care.